There is a slight difference between entering and exiting a traffic pattern at a control tower airport versus a non-control tower airport and the communications associated with those. We're going to discuss the uh, entry procedures and exit procedures for a non-control tower airport as it's listed in the AIM. Uh, first, we're going to discuss approaching or arriving at the non-control tower, non tower airport. Let's say, for example, that this was going to be uh, Greenwood, and Greenwood Airport has runway 9 and 27. And hopefully you've listened to the weather, the ASOS or AWOS, whatever's available at that air airport, beforehand. So when you are about 10 miles out, you'll be ready to announce your position and your intentions at that airport. So, for example, if the wind was coming out of the west-northwest, and you've already chosen runway 27 mentally, you, when you are about 10 miles out, you would make your first call. Now, at a non-control tower airport, we always state the name of the airport before and after our transmission because we're using the CTAF. The CTAF is the Common Traffic Advisory Frequency. And common means that many airports use that frequency. And that means that there are many pilots keying up and talking over each other. So by you saying the name of the airport before and after your transmission, if part of it was blocked by another pilot, hopefully someone still heard which airport you were at. It's very uncomfortable to be on final at an airport and hear somebody else on final, and suddenly you're alert and thinking, oh my gosh, they're right where I am. But in reality, you also heard them key up at Columbia Owens, so you know it was not the same airport as you. So how the communication sequence would work is when you're about 10 miles out, in this example, we may say Greenwood traffic, Cessna 4642 Juliet, 10 miles to the southwest, 3000 inbound for runway 27. That way, if any other traffic is arriving or departing the area, they know exactly where to look for us. Then, when we arrive a little closer to the airport, perhaps three miles away, then you would announce your position again with your intentions. So in this example, we may say Greenwood traffic, Cessna 4642 Juliet, three miles south at, southwest, descending through 2500 to enter left downwind for runway 27. And then finally, as you're entering into the pattern itself, you want to arrive at the traffic pattern altitude. Now, at Greenwood, the field elevation is approximately 631 feet. And normally, you would add 1,000 feet to the field elevation to fly that traffic pattern. So a standard traffic pattern altitude at a non-control tower airport would be 1,000 AGL, or 1,000 feet above the ground. If, if it's anything other than that, you'd have to refer to the, air, um, the uh, airport facility directory, and it would tell you in there. Sometimes uh, airport traffic patterns may be seven or 800 feet above the ground for one reason or another, perhaps overlying airspace. But the standard would be 1,000 feet above our uh, field elevation. So we would just take our 1,000 and add it to the field elevation. So we would expect our traffic pattern altitude to be about 1,600. We want to arrive at the pattern at that altitude. The AIM does not uh, recommend that you descend down into the pattern because there may be someone below you that you didn't see. So they prefer that you already be at that pattern altitude as you arrive into the pattern. Now, by entering in on the 45 degree downwind, it gives you a nice view of anyone in this area or anyone in this area as you're arriving. Now keep in mind, we are discussing radio communications, but communications are not a requirement to enter and exit out of non-control tower airports. Uh, there are many small airplanes such as a Piper Cub that don't have radios at all. So you need to be very vigilant and look around to make sure that you don't see any other airplanes. So now, as you enter in the downwind, your communications would be something similar to this. Greenwood traffic, Cessna 4642 Juliet entering left downwind for runway 27, Greenwood traffic. Now, the reason we want to specify the left downwind is because it certainly shows where we are in the pattern. If we were on a right downwind, then our position would be here. We'd go down, right downwind, right base, and then final. But by specifically saying left downwind, everybody would know that you are on the south side of that airport. Now, once we're in the downwind and we're ready to turn base, then we would say Greenwood traffic, Cessna 4642 Juliet, turning left base for runway 27, Greenwood traffic. And then as we turn final, uh, we don't need to specify that we're turning left final because final is final. There's only one place you could be. So when you turn final, your communications would be something similar to Greenwood traffic, 
Cessna 4642 Juliet final for runway 27 Greenwood traffic. Now if you chose to do a touch and go and take back off, that as you were taking off, um, you may want to say Greenwood traffic, Cessna 4642 Juliet departing runway 27 remaining in the pattern. And that way, again, if there's any other traffic in the area, they know exactly what your intentions are. And as you're departing now, um, you would then turn crosswind. So your communication would be Greenwood traffic, Cessna 4642 Juliet, left crosswind for runway 27, Greenwood traffic. Again, the, the rules or sequence we're using is we're saying the name of the airport before and after our transmission. We are saying our call sign and we're saying our position, definitely specifying whether we are left or right traffic. So that's how our communication sequence works. We want to make a 10 mile out call, a 3 mile out call, entering the pattern, uh, left downwind, left base, final, departing, and left crosswind, and we can go around and around in the same sequence. Now we're going to discuss what should we do if we are going to exit the pattern. In order to exit the pattern, if we were going to depart runway 27, then hopefully we would say Greenwood traffic, Cessna 4642 Juliet, departing runway 27, Greenwood traffic. The proper departure, or I would say proper, but really recommended by the uh, AIM, the FAR AIM, is if you're going to depart the pattern in any direction opposite the traffic pattern's uh, sequence, then they would prefer that you climb to 1,000 feet before you make your turn. What this does is it gets your airplane out away from the pattern before you make a turn opposing the direction of the pattern. If you were going to depart and you were going to turn in the direction, like your departure uh, plan was to go somewhere to the southwest or south or southeast, you're really going in the direction the pattern is going, then they prefer that you climb out about 500 feet and then depart at a 45 degree angle and then turn as you're climbing and continue to depart the area. So your departure procedures at a non-control tower airport is if you're going to go in the opposite direction of the traffic flow, you should climb to 1,000 feet above the ground before making your turn. If you're going to depart in the direction of the flow of traffic, then they recommend that you climb to 500 feet and then turn at about a 45 degree angle, and as you continue to climb, you can depart in whichever direction you prefer to go. Now that we understand how the pattern works, and uh, we understand that a normal traffic pattern is a left-hand turn, there are right-handed patterns, and the right-handed patterns, if you look on the sectional chart, it'll say RP9, for example. And what that means is they want the right-handed pattern for runway 9 in this example. So if I were using runway 9, then I would actually be on this side and I would go right downwind, right base, and final for runway 9. Now Greenwood is not listed like that, so both of the patterns would go left-hand turns. Now what we actually do with the aircraft, how do we fly the aircraft to make this pattern work out properly, is we want to start slowing down to some sort of uh, manageable speed as we're coming into the pattern. So if your normal cruise speed was, for example, 115, you may want to start slowing the airplane down to about 90 as you're descending to come into the pattern. The standard way to fly or manipulate the aircraft in the pattern works like this. On the downwind, we like to do our before landing checklist. And a before landing checklist is a memorized checklist. I know we teach that you should always read your written checklist, but when, when it's a busy time in the traffic pattern, it's better to have your head outside looking around and do the memorized checklist. The one that we like to use that works for any aircraft is GLUMPS. G-L-U-M-P-S. And what this GLUMPS, or before landing checklist, stands for is the G stands for gas. So if you have a low wing airplane, you would typically turn on your uh, electric fuel pump and also make sure the fuel is on both or the fullest tank. If you have a high wing airplane, normally they don't have an uh, electric fuel pump, but you would still double check and make sure that your fuel is on both or the fullest tank. The L stands for landing light. Now the landing light isn't really required in the traffic pattern, but it's much easier to see another aircraft with their landing light on. So it was common practice we use the landing light while we're flying around in the traffic pattern. The U stands for undercarriage. 
Your undercarriage would be your landing gear. Now, I know that when you first learn to fly, you typically do not fly in an airplane with retractable landing gear. But if we can learn this as part of our before landing checklist, then hopefully when you advance to a complex aircraft, you'll never forget to put the gear down. The M stands for mixture. Now, as you advance the mixture, be cautious to do it smoothly and slowly. Your fuel is very cold, it's out in your wings, and if you add very cold fuel quickly to your hot cylinders, you may crack something. So be very cautious as to how you add the mixture. The P stands for prop or propeller, and the propeller would go full forward to the highest RPM if you had an airplane with a constant speed prop. Again, always move your controls in the aircraft slow and steady, don't rapidly push it forward. And then S is for your seat belts. Be sure that you and your passenger seat belts are snug and securely fastened. So we would do our glimpse check on the downwind or just entering into the downwind. Once you're a beam the numbers, a beam means beside. Once you're a beam the numbers of the runway that you're landing on, you would uh, normally uh, Pull your carburetor heat on, if applicable. So you pull your carb heat on. You reduce the throttle to about 1,500 RPMs. And you would hold the aircraft's nose level with the horizon to cause the airplane to slow into the white arc or your VFE. That's on your airspeed indicator. So once the aircraft has slowed, you're holding the back pressure to slow the aircraft down into your uh, VFE speed, then you can add 10 degrees of flaps. Once you've added the flaps in, you may now allow the nose to settle a little bit for a normal descent picture. And I like to think about it as the distance that I see between the dash and the horizon. If I typically see an inch sitting flying straight and level, then I allow that distance to be doubled to set up my descent picture. So as I allow the nose to come down and hold it in that, pic in that um, nice descent picture, I retrim the aircraft and make sure that it flies nicely in a descent. And usually you end up with about a 500 foot rate descent around the rest of the pattern. Now of course you may have to adjust the throttle and adjust your descent according to how windy it is, but sometimes you get a wind gust that lifts you up and sometimes the wind suddenly stops and your airplane settles quickly. Now how we know when to turn base is at a 45 degree angle with the corner of the runway. So at this 45 degree angle, we are descending about 500 feet per minute and we begin our turn to base. And when you're established on base, you would use 20 degrees of flaps. Now, where you actually apply the flaps in your base leg is up to your discretion. If you see that you look a, a little bit high at this point, then you should add your flaps in earlier because they're going to slow the aircraft down and help you descend quicker. Um, also, if, if you see that you're a little bit low, you may want to delay adding flaps. And sometimes you may want to delay adding flaps until you're on final. But we're just talking about a, a you know, very typically flume traffic pattern. And once we turn final, then we would usually add 30 degrees of flaps. They, the um, professionals recommend not to add flaps when you're in the turn, just in case you ended up with asymmetrical flaps. That's flaps without symmetry, asymmetrical, meaning that one flap went down and the other one didn't. It will cause the aircraft to begin to roll and it may confuse the pilot and be hard to uh, correct the situation. So try to avoid applying flaps when you're in the turn. Once you've turned final and you apply 30 degrees of flaps, reserve your last flap setting, which is usually 40 degrees of flaps, until you are very sure that even if in the event that your engine failed, you could still glide and make that runway. So once you're sure that you could glide and make the runway, you would normally add full flaps, the rest of your flaps in there, and then proceed across the threshold, uh, start reducing the throttle, smoothly reducing the throttle. You don't ever want to really, you know, just yank it backwards. Smoothly reduce the throttle and go into your level off and then finally your flare. Now, if you're going to do a touch and go and take back off, be sure that we clean the airplane up before we add power because we don't want to take, try to take off if we have flaps in and your carburetor heat out and the trim isn't reset. So when you go to depart, make sure that you point, uh, retract your flaps, and I like to visually inspect over my shoulders to be sure those flaps are really coming up, and then we'll turn the carburetor heat off, if applicable, reset our trim, and then add full throttle and depart, making our radio call preferably as we depart. 
Now, how do I know when to turn crosswind is I would usually climb to about 500 feet before making my crosswind turn. The AIM recommends between 500 to 700. Um, I like to turn on the earlier side of that because if, for example, I had started my turn, as, I mean, started my turn to uh, crosswind and I was climbing through eight or 900 feet and the engine quit, I have a much better chance to try to make it back to that runway or perhaps if there was a crisscrossing runway then I could make it back in the event that the engine failed. Um, but usually at about 500 feet above the ground you would turn and make your crosswind leg and then as you're continuing to climb then you would turn your downwind leg and the whole process starts all over again. So this is how we really want to fly the traffic pattern is when you're on the downwind we consider our glimpse check, gas, lights, undercarriage, mixture, prop, and seat belts. And once you're a beam the numbers, you work left to right in the cockpit. So it's carburetor heat on, power to about 1500 RPMs, maintaining back pressure to allow the airplane to slow down into the white arc so you can apply 10 degrees of flaps, let the nose settle, and retrim it for a descent, usually about 500 feet per minute. As we turn uh, base, then we would um, roll out, we usually add an additional 20 degrees of flaps, and then you turn final, add usually 30 degrees of flaps, and then when you're assured that you would make the runway, you add full flaps and proceed with your landing.